All right, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to everyone joining us on Zoom. This is the weekly HAI seminar uh, workshop, and my name is Rob Reich. I'm a professor in the political science department. Uh, I teach and research political philosophy. I serve as the one of the associate directors of the Institute for Human-Centered AI. I also uh, work with the Center for Ethics and Society on campus. And uh, you're in for a real treat today. Uh, our guest today is Professor Ellen Landemore, who is a political philosopher whose primary appointment is at Yale. Uh, by my lights, Ellen is one of the most interesting and most important political philosophers writing in the English language today, although she also writes in French, so maybe I can't evaluate what goes on there. But certainly in the English language, uh, her work is just a powerful significance and interest. Um, by way of introduction to her, I should say that, you know, when you think about the common phrase these used, uh, used these days about ethics and AI or ethics and technology and democracy, almost always what we think about is the ways in which big tech, artificial intelligence, machine learning algorithms um, is in certain respects undermining or threatening um, democratic ideals and aspirations. And Hélène is completely aware of and sensitive to these concerns, but is one of the most important and interesting pioneers in trying to rethink how technology, chiefly through AI and the kinds of things that happen in computer science departments and are developed by engineers, can help us to reimagine democratic institutions themselves, to reinvent them for the 21st century. Uh, she wrote uh, a wonderful book that uh, came out just a year or two ago called Open Democracy, where open democracy's aspiration is to try to imagine not merely as a theoretical exercise, but through actual case studies of things that have happened in different places in the world, ways in which representation itself, this, this core kind of institutional arrangement for modern democracies at enormous scale, manage themselves, technology can help us to move beyond representation and in that respect, reinvigorate civic, civic voice, citizenship engagement, and find new ways to participate in the kind of civic deliberation that sits at the heart of any well-functioning democratic society. Um, she and I were the co-editors, along with a colleague of ours here at Stanford named Lucy Bernholtz, of an edited volume that came out a few years ago, years ago called Digital Technology and Democratic Theory. And what you're going to hear from Helen today is really an extension of some of the work that she's been doing for the past you know, 10 years at least, um, but with now with a deliberate focus and collaboration even with people who are computer scientists. And so the presentation today is going to be uh, about uh, can AI bring deliberation to the masses. Um, I'll mention just by way of further introduction that she has um, 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 this academic book or university press book called Open Democracy, but certainly something um, that I highly recommend. And she's going to take some of the, the, the core um, arguments that she's made there along with the research she's been doing um, since it's been published. And she has a, um, a book coming out in, in a year or two um, in the midst of writing it right now with a fantastic title called Politics Without Politicians. Um, that's the idea of getting beyond representation. And um, um, that was the title of a New Yorker profile of, of Ellen and her work on, on AI and democracy, politics without politicians. So I highly recommend that to you. The title of the presentation is, Can AI Bring Deliberation to the Masses? Um, far from someone who exists just in the ivory tower at Yale University, um, Ellen also does all kinds of work um, um, with uh, um, social movements, with various ways of engaging with activists and trying to find ways to reinvent democracy. She serves as a member of the Governance Committee for the new French Citizens Assembly on Assisted Dying, and just recently she completed a term as a visiting professor at the Center for Ethics in AI at Oxford University. Okay, a couple logistics for today. For the Zoom audience, uh, you can use the Zoom chat to message the group, and um, we really encourage you to ask questions through the Slido app. Um, you can click on that link, um, and that will be in the chat very shortly. I, as the moderator, will choose some questions from Slido um, after the presentation, and Slido has this upvoting feature that you can use to try to upvote the questions that you would like me to um, present um, from the Zoom audience. In the live audience, you are also welcome to use the Slido app with the QR codes that are sitting in front of you. But of, of course, if you'd rather have a fully embodied experience by asking your question in person, you're welcome to do that too. Probably recommend that over the Slido. Let's, let's, um, let's take advantage of the fact that we're back in person. 
Closed captioning has been enabled for this webinar, and so you can click on the closed captioning feature on the Zoom screen there to show captions throughout the hour. Um, Alain will present for about 40 minutes, so we'll have 20 minutes for Q&A. And uh, would you please join me in waking, well, welcoming uh, Helene Landemore. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor Rich, for the overly generous introduction. You can tell he's a friend. Um, so, so in the interest of time, because I realize I have a relatively long PowerPoint, I'll go straight to the, the point. I, I'm trying to tackle in this um, paper, which uh, uh, is still in progress, this question, can AI bring deliberation to the masses? So it's kind of a version of politics without politicians, but with AI, in a way. Uh, <clears throat> So I take it that um, there's a core problem in democratic theory, sorry, that's um, the following. Deliberative Democrats, uh, you know, like myself, believe that the full legitimacy of a democratic system requires that laws uh, and policies be the product of a public inclusive deliber deliberation among free and equals. The problem is that in practice, uh, and possibly in theory, we know that deliberation only works in the seminar room. Vast threshold, maybe a few hundreds, maybe a few thousands, usually broken down into smaller groups. Deliberation needs to be delegated to representatives, and in our system, we delegate that task to, um, among others, elected officials. So the problem is that many people end up excluded from the deliberations that shape laws and policies, and we end up with a legitimacy deficit. So why um, doesn't deliberation scale? Sorry, I can't um, now move my to the next slide for some reason. Well, but she changed something and the, the arrow is, I just don't see it. Clicking on the screen. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, it's not responding anymore. Okay, so I'll continue anyway. Um, so deliberation doesn't scale because of uh, obvious limitations like time, the, the cost of, of running inclusive deliberation and the cognitive and physiological, physiological limitations of human beings, as we know. Um, deliberation and, and democracy would take too many evenings if we were all involved at all times. So voting certainly scales, that's why we have mass participation in the form of referenda, but deliberation does not. So can AI help with some or all of these problems? Can AI get us to fully inclusive mass deliberation, if that's indeed the ideal, and should it? And if not, is an approximation of that ideal both possible and good enough for legitimation purposes? Finally, what practical and ethical problems would um, such an approximation still raise? Um, so that's the, the, the sort of set of questions that I'm interested in. I preface this by saying that I, I start with a very minimal definition of AI um, as the ability of a computer system to perform complex tasks, normally requiring human intelligence, such as visual perception, speech recognition, decision making and translation between languages. In some respects, some of the tasks I, I uh, assign to AI could be assigned to a smart clock, uh, if it's just timekeeping or certain things like this, but some of the tasks that I hope to assign to AI are also very demanding, and I, I don't think the, the algorithm are there yet. So there's a range of um, on, on the continuum um, of artificial intelligence. So I'm going to proceed as follows. Um, first, I'm going to explain what I mean by this conundrum in deliberative democracy a little bit more, the, the quality deliberation versus mass participation trade-off and why it's considered a problem in the field. Then I'll talk about a low-tech low attempt to scale face-to-face -face deliberation that's been very inspiring for me, the so-called French great national debate, very, very flawed attempt to, um, in my view, structure the uh, so-called deliberation, um, the, the, the deliberation in the wild uh, that Habermas theorizes. And finally, I'll talk about two models of AI-powered mass deliberation, one that uh, has been theorized by a Russian engineer named uh, Cyril Velikanov called mass online deliberation. And what I'm proposing as rotating uh, multiplicity of mini publics or um, you know, um, many uh, rotating mini publics, 
uh, and I'll, I'll say a bit more about what I mean by that. So the conundrum in deliberative democracy. I start from one of the seminal statements by Josh Cohen uh, in 1989, where he theorizes the vision, uh, a vision of, a, of, a, of, of political legitimacy. The notion of a, I quote, the notion of a deliberative democracy is rooted in the intuitive ideal of a democratic association in which the justification of the terms and conditions of association proceeds through public arguments and reasoning among equal citizens. Citizens in such an order share a commitment to the resolution of problems of collective choice through public reasoning and regard their basic institutions as legitimate insofar as they establish the framework for pre free public deliberation. So one way to read this, um, to simplify, <laughs> is that laws, constitutional laws in particular, but also presumably, presumably some ordinary laws, are legitimate only to the extent that they are or could have been. There's a, also some, some uh, disagreement about whether this is an actual or, or hypothetical uh, version of, of the deliberation. The result of a deliberation among all the members of the community on equal grounds. So I think this ideal, by the way, it doesn't mean that it has to be de direct democracy all the time on all issues. I think this is perfectly compatible with representation because there could be a moment of mass deliberation that authorizes uh, delegation to elected or otherwise selected representatives. But at the very beginning and probably at regular intervals, you'd need some moment of authentic, all-inclusive mass deliberation. Um, and by deliberation here, it's a relatively demanding ideal that's uh, posited, right? It's an exchange of reasons and arguments that could take the form of uh, narrative and storytelling, but are still at the core about, uh, you know, reasons that are meant to generate justifications to endorse the policy and laws for everyone. So that's what generates gen uh, deliberative legitimacy. And uh, I, th I think there are various reasons to want this. It's a form of uh, respect towards uh, members of the community, but it's also a way to generate better outcomes on average through the forceless force of the better argument. So it's a form of output uh, legitimacy with, with what I consider, which what I, what I would call um, epistemic properties. So again, the problem is that deliberation thus conceived does not scale. And Jim Fishkin, who's a professor in the communications department here, has really put in need the the dilemma, we can have mass participation or quality deliberation, but we cannot have both. At the same time, you have people uh, uh, in the Habermasian tradition, like Christina Lafont, who've recently made a very forceful case for maintaining the ideal of mass participation. She writes, there can be no democratization without improved mass deliberation. So there's a big sort of debate between her and Jim Fishkin, and I suppose myself as well. Um, because uh, Jim Fishkin and myself are willing to give mini publics, uh, randomly selected bodies, decision making power, legislative power, even in my case. Uh, and Christina Lafont thinks that would be a violation of, of uh, political legitimacy, of, uh, you know, of, from within the framework of deliberative democracy. So we've got this tension between those two ideals. So in Habermas, the solution is to go to a two track uh, model. Because in fact, he, he departs from Cohen in, in, in identifying the need to distinguish between two types of um, deliberation. He writes, in contrast to Cohen, I would like to understand the legitimizing procedure, i.e. public deliberation, as the core structure in a separate constitutionally organized political system, but not as a model for all social institutions and not even for all government institutions. So what I understand this to mean is that only the people involved in the organized political system need to deliberate per se in this very demanding sense. So he pictures a two track public sphere where track one is the sphere of politicians who deliberate in a, in a strong sense. And the rest of us in, in, in the larger public sphere who deliberate in the wild, uh, in coffee shops, in taxis, in, you know, uh, in our families, uh, through the media, through op-eds, etc. But the thing is that now we have two concepts of deliberation, one that's uh, oriented toward will formation, one that's uh, oriented toward opinion formation. It's not just that they have a different orientation, it's also that one is a true discursive exchange among individuals, whereas the other one, to my reading at least, uh, in my reading at least, is, is a communication flaw between various entities, including but not restricted to individuals. 
So we get mass deliberation in a way, but it's no longer deliberation among individuals. It's deliberation among all kinds of entities, parties, the media. It becomes too um, uh, diluted and to my mind doesn't take the moral primacy and equality of deliberators sufficiently seriously. In fact, Habermas himself recognizes that there will be asymmetries of power. People won't deliberate as equals. Some people won't even deliberate at all. There, would be, there will be coordination problems in track two that are enormous because who's really setting the agenda for track one? Uh, mostly the people with money, access, etc. So it's hard to imagine that deliberation so weakly conceived could have the legitimizing properties that uh, Cohen for one envisaged. And what's the reason that we can't have um, public deliberation in a strong sense structure the whole of society for Habermas? He says, because otherwise deliberative politics would have to be inflated into a structure shaping the totality of society. And this is impossible, he writes, for the simple reason that democratic procedure must be embedded in context it cannot itself regulate. So there's a feasibility constraint here, which is also a normative injunction, I believe. And I think we should perhaps question both um, and try to envision um, an alternative solution to this two-track sphere where only the officials really deliberate seriously. And that would be a public deliberation uh, that structure that, that is a structuring norm, not just of the governmental sphere, but of the whole society, like in Cohen's earlier vision, but that would structure deliberation without regulating it. And that I think is a very hard sort of a um, you know, path uh, to, to, to identify. So the idea would be to equalize with that loss of freedom. So now, assuming we need real non-metaphorical mass deliberation for legitimation purposes, what does all-inclusive mass deliberation even mean to begin with? Is it technically feasible? And if we can't get that, can we get the next best thing that would be close enough to, to generate legitimacy? And I'm not gonna explore that uh, possibility, but there's another possibility, which is that we give up on the conception of, of legitimacy offered by deliberative Democrats as too demanding. Because if Christina Lafon is right that we can't, we, we need mass uh, deliberation, and it turns out we cannot get it, or whatever we get is not close enough to generate legitimacy, then maybe we should just give up. And the best we can get is instead, small scale deliberation amongst officials, combined with a moment of mass voting, which is what we have now, or um, we go back to Habermas' solution of real deliberation among the, the few and a sort of metaphorical deliberation with all the problems that I've uh, identified. So if that's the case, then we have a reduction of the, of the whole ideal of, of uh, deliberative democracy, in my view. So I'm going to try to save it first. And to do that, I'm gonna look now at a low-tech attempt to scale face-to-face -face deliberation to millions of people. And the way AI could have helped, even though it didn't uh, in, in this particular case. So we have to wait a little bit more for AI to, to make an appearance in this story. So you may remember that in November, 2018, France uh, experienced a wave of social protests called the Yellow Vest um, uh, Movement. Um, it was led by people who rejected a, a carbon tax that uh, the government had tried to, to levy rather uh, um, brutally. And so um, this led the government to have to face two choices, right? Either it could use repression or engage in deliberation. They chose deliberation. And President Macron wrote a letter to the French saying he invited them to join him in a great national debate around four key issues for two months. Um, so that they could start building together a republic of permanent deliberation. So for two months, politics was literally on pause and uh, various forms of uh, participation and deliberation took place. I'm not gonna talk about all of them, but just to give you a sense, you had online, an online platform that was opened by the government. You had local meetings of self-selected people joining you know, in various locations. You had uh, 21 regional assemblies selected at random. You had emails and mails sent to the government. You had grievance books written in city halls and, and schools, like in the French Revolution. You had stand de proximité, which I didn't know how to translate. These were terminals in train stations and post offices to ensure that the homeless and, and people who usually were very difficult to reach could be reached. 
You had also national thematic conferences so that the intermediary bodies, you know, unions, associations, business associations, etc., could also be consulted. So a very rich um, ecology of, uh, of uh, participatory formats. So this is what the deliberative platform looked like with a very boring uh, online, you know, uh, platform that only allowed people to throw in comments, no deliberative feature whatsoever. So it wasn't particularly successful, but it did draw uh, around 2.8 million visitors. There were local meetings of self-selected participants. And as you can tell from this picture, which is quite representative, <laughs> This drew mostly older people with a lot of time on their hands and mostly Macron supporters. And so basically the yellow vests were not to be found in any of those meetings. So the, the target of the, 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 you know, the people who had any sort of um, caused this whole thing to happen didn't feel like this was a place for them. So more interesting to me are the 21 region, regional randomly selected assembly that um, uh, took place in our 13 regions, our five ultramarine territories and in uh, in one city, um, there was a gathering of all the youth. Um, they were based uh, on, on random selection for the most part. They gathered around 1,404 um, 1404 um, participants for roughly uh, two days of deliberation over two weeks. They were selected following a, a methodology of stratified random sampling. So 300,000 phone numbers were generated uh, you know, an agency called 80,000 people, got their details, and then selected a sample based on, on you know, uh, criteria that made it as representative as possible of the larger population. They looked like this. I went to um, one of them in Rouen, and there you had yellow vest because, of course, randomness helps you reach out uh, the people that, that would not come based on self-selection. So was the great national debate a form of mass participation? I think, I think it was. It's not the mass participation you get in, in referenda, because only something like 1.5% of the population really engaged directly in measurable ways. But um, it's the biggest thing we've ever done in France, I think, to date. And I think I'm not sure many countries have had anything similar. So there were around 500,000 people involved in the local meetings. Up to 1.5 million were involved online. As I said, uh, 1,400 people were involved in the regional assemblies, etc. And if you count the ripple effects also, for example, the true debate, which was uh, created as an alternative uh, by the yellow vests and their sympathizers, you had another 40, 45,000 participants that joined. Still not that much, all of it, you know, compared to the 67 million French people, but it's, it's you know, uh, much bigger than, again, uh, many of the, of the things that have been, that been attempted before. So now, was it a grand national debate mass deliberation or deliberation at scale? I would say no, because out of the, <coughs> maybe outside of the locally organized um, self-selected regional assemblies, the local assemblies and the randomly selected assemblies, there was, um, not sure there was deliberation in the demanding sense that I posited at the beginning. Uh, and there are all kinds of problems with the, the deliberation that took place in self-selected environments where the usual suspects took a lot of you know, space and talked over people because there was no facilitation, et cetera. So that said, um, it's a good example of how deliberation in the wild functions, I suppose, because I think people talk to their neighbors about this or you know, this was, there was something like deliberation uh, in the wild, but not the mass deliberation that I am after. So my view is that what the great national debate did to a degree is show us a path beyond the, the Habermasian model, which is to create a structured track, track three, where you've got the same structure and demanding notion of deliberation that you have in track one, but it's inclusive of a much larger uh, number of people. And it could be oriented towards decision maybe. Um, so now let's go back to AI. AI did not play a role in the great national debate, but I think it, it was a missed opportunity in a way because it really could have. It could have been used as a facilitator of small group discussions. Uh, for example, in the self-selected, self-organized uh, groups, you, you, as, I, as I said, the, the dynamics were not exactly egalitarian. I think uh, an automated sort of uh, distribution of, of speaking rights would have actually been better. 
And we know that it's doable because uh, here at Stanford, uh, Jim Fishkin already does that with uh, an algorithm called Alice, after the person who gave, uh, gave the algorithm her voice. Um, AI could also have played a role as a, as a source of information for deliberators, a sort of uh, Alexa for deliberation. In, in the great national debate, there were, as far as I know, um, uh, no fact checkers, but I think the animators walked around and, and, and talked to the, and, and just checked Google basically uh, for answers to the question of the participants. So. And uh, AI could also have been used as a synthesizer of results and aggregators of, of, um, of data after the fact. As it turns out, the tools that were used were really primitive. Um, the six million online contributions were an analyzed through automated text analysis by two private companies. Um, and everything else, the emails, the grievance books, et cetera, the, 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 the written output of the, of the regional assemblies were analyzed using uh, methods from the 60s, like the knowledge trees of, of Michel Serre, which are actually really nice tools, but it's not like as cutting edge as it could have been, right? They, they're, they're, for those of you who don't know those tools, um, the idea is that the consensual ideas represent the trunk, and then the diverging views are the, the branches, and then every single idea that, that is kind of not contained in those um, uh, formalizations are attached as leaves. So you get a really, you don't lose the content. It's a really nice, uh, nice tool. But the fact is that um, because the design was a bit haphazard, there was no way to really clearly understand the relationship between all this contribution and how to create um, a hierarchy between them. For example, what's the value of, of the online contributions versus the output of the regional assemblies. So all of that was very messy. And the result is that very little of the contributions of the, of the great national debate ended up making a difference. The one thing that made a big difference is that, um, and I'll say a word about this next, the regional assemblies converged on the idea of uh, new forms of democratic governance on climate issues. And that led to the uh, climate um, convention that took place the following fall. And I, I won't talk about it, but I think this is at least one very, very positive outcome that came out of, of the great national debate. Okay, now let me turn to, <clears throat> to the two models of AI-powered mass deliberation that I imagine or, or like, uh, uh, envisage based on this, uh, in part, uh, based on, on the limitations of, of uh, the great national debate. So, um, could AI help in even more ambitious ways? Recall that we are trying to achieve at the limit uh, deliberation of all with all. So it's probably an unfeasible ideal, for now at least, so what are the best approximations we can go for? I see two right now. One is um, the concept of mass online deliberation that I borrow from, from this Russian engineer, uh, Cyril Velikanov. He and, uh, and his co-author recently wrote a paper where they describe mass online de deliberation this way. It's a mode of integrated communication of the whole community, <coughs> regardless of its size, in one common room with everybody addressing the whole community and having an integrated vision of the deliberation results of the whole community. So that helps, I think of it as a sort of a Wikipedia, like an open space, an online community where everybody works together on the same thing, but like, except that this wouldn't be a bunch of articles, but like a joint, a joint vision or a joint uh, conversation. They further describe this as follows. Our mass online deliberation model defines an integrated deliberation space where every participant deliberatively addresses the whole community and gets back deliberation data somehow integrated from the whole community. Somehow integrated means a set of backstage procedures that work permanently or at regular intervals on the whole space of deliberation data, so proposals, comments, appraisals, etc., produced by individual participants. So what, what is the role of algorithm in all of this? Because they, they theorized that role. Interestingly, it's um, quite limited, but important. The algorithm sorts and cluster proposals to offer every participant a bird's eye view onto the whole sea of participants' contributions. So it simplifies and clusters and aggregates in a way that's manageable for any single um, human being. It also prods humans to take on content moderation, facilitation, content organization, and evaluation tasks. So the, the, the algorithm basically will nudge you to choose a function and, and do some of that work. 
uh, either based on, on random uh, assignment or on your willingness to serve as a, as, a, as a translator, for example, because you have skills in that language. Um, and, and, and the, yeah, sorry, the, and the, the third task is translation task in multilingual contexts um, or just distribution of the function of translation to humans. So for a reason that I'm, I'm not totally clear uh, about, uh, Velikanov and, and his co-author are not eager to directly automate many of, these, uh, many of these tasks. But I think one could imagine automating most of the task, aggregation, um, translation, et cetera, to leave humans with the sole role of evaluating proposals or generating them too, of course, um, to minimize time constraints, cognitive burdens, and maximize participation, right? If you have less to do, then you're more interested in, in staying and, and, and um, contributing to the conversation. So while I like this model and I find it inspiring, there are some important limits to it. First of all, it's to this day a thought experiment. Uh, except the evaluation task um, that has already been you know, experimented with in, in a Finnish experiment that I was also a part of. I don't think any of what they describe has been tried. Um, so a big unknown is whether mass online deliberation could actually accommodate a sufficiently large proportion of the population so that we can talk about mass deliberation, right? Uh, we don't know if it works for a few hundred people, so forget about millions of them, right? Um, there's also a question as to the nature of the division of labor and, and, and this bird's eye view that they posit. Does it allow you really to understand the, the full concept of what's being discussed or, or are you still in a sort of a partial, limited and, and in a partial um, relationship to it? Another question is whether we're really talking about deliberation here or is it just a superficial engagement for most people who will just edit a little bit of the proposal or, or add a comment and leave or add a like and leave as opposed to a genuine deliberation around reasons and arguments. Finally, um, there's a problem in who participates. And I'm not entirely sure whether it's, uh, it, this problem can be solved when you start having millions of people involved, but uh, if a group is too small, the self-selection bias will, will lead to a lack of representativeness for sure. So I think these are the reasons why I, I don't find this model entirely um, attractive, although I'm sure um, there are some functions for which it could be deployed. So I'm turning to this second model, uh, multiple rotating mini publics, or I don't know, MM, MRM, maybe. If you have a better idea about how to call it, I'd, I'd welcome uh, it. And the, the, the concept is to enroll it's also a thought experiment, obviously, would be to enroll the whole population into as many randomly selected mini publics as needed and um, to rotate them until everyone has spoken with everyone. I think, I, I think that's the closest you could get to all inclusive deliberation of all with all. And again, I, I sort of generalize here from the case of the um, regional assemblies in France. I think what, the beauty of doing that is that we're trying to approximate what the mass public would think on, on particular issues or what recommendations they would come up with if we could get them all in the same room, right? And there is tiny bit of evidence from the regional assemblies in France that when you break down people into um, you know, randomly selected assemblies, they converge. So in the French case, for example, if you look at the, the blue leaves over there, um, 12 assemblies out of uh, the 18 that were uh, considered converge on the idea renew governance to successfully uh, achieve ecological the ecological transition. And apparently that slide that convinced President Macron to launch his, um, his um, convention, Citizens Convention for Climate after the great national debate. So there was this idea that if 12 you know, random sample of the population converge on some idea, it must be the case that the larger public um, would think the same way if, if we asked them or if they were given the chance to think about it. Um, so what if we did that fully to include everyone? Um, so the limits of the, well, of the, the regional assembly case is that first, the, each assembly was drawn from a different pool, a regional pool, as opposed to the whole assembly. So they're not strictly comparable. Uh, and 
they didn't involve a sufficient number of people, 1,400 people, it's not mass deliberation by, by any uh, measure. And there was also no rotation between the assemblies, so you, you didn't even uh, ensure a sort of uh, uh, exposure to all the arguments that were generated in, in these different contexts. So it's not a, a, a good simulation of what 67 million people, let alone, it's not, it's not even close to what mass deliberation uh, should look like. So again, if we take that and, and um, envis envision something more ambitious, what will it look like? So I imagine the whole of France enrolled in similar um, randomly selected assemblies, all drawn from the same pool, organized online because it's less costly, obviously, and much more feasible, on something like a citizen book, you know, Facebook, but a civic version of it. So you could have 670,000 assemblies of 100 people to cover the entire French population, or perhaps 134,000 of 500 people each. You make them deliberate, um, and then you rotate people inside and recreate uh, a second batch of assemblies where people can deliberate further. So the idea is that you, you, you ensure that everyone talks to everyone else. That I think again is as close to all inclusive deliberation as you can get, but obviously it's you know um, probably entirely impractical, very costly, too long, and the diminishing returns would be reached very soon in the process because you'd end up talking again and again and again and again about the same thing with very similar uh, people. So that's I don't know. I tried to give you an alternative uh, representation to. To, to give a pendant to the Habermasian picture. So it's something like this, like a, a network of, a, of rotating assemblies. So if we can't do that, can we do something that involves fewer people, but still looks like that? And I was thinking in terms of what would be a minimum threshold of participation in something like this. And I, if you think in, in, in um, you know, in relation to mass voting, what is the, sort of floor for mass voting that, that's considered um, high enough for the decision to be legitimate. We typically think it's 50% of the voting population. Under that, referenda become suspicious because you think that, well, people are not sufficiently interested or the sample is not sufficiently representative, etc. Now, what would be um, a floor for mass deliberation, given that deliberation is a much more demanding task? I suggested before that 1.5% in the context of the great national debate was too low a threshold, right? 50% is probably too ambitious. So it's gotta be somewhere in between. And I'm gonna speculate without many, many reasons to back that up, that 10 to 15% might be a good threshold. It would still involve millions of people. Um, and if you, if you have truly random samples, then the views would be quite representative. And you would get the mass that people like Christina Lafont are asking for. So it would still be much better than just having 150 or at most 500 people involved in, in a citizens assembly. And here I'm also thinking uh, that this sort of threshold corresponds to what um, Jim Fishkin and Bruce Ackerman had theorized in their own vision for a sort of mass deliberation that they called deliberation day. So in 2005, they came up with that scheme of a deliberation day occurring all over America um, among participants that would not be uh, drawn at random from the population but self-select into local meetings but where they would be assigned at random to certain subgroups and they said that in their estimates um, they would expect about 30 million Americans to join the first year and that's about nine percent I think of the of the American population so I don't know it sounds to me like a like a reasonable threshold Okay, let's go, let's get to AI now. So what would be um, a role for AI in um, uh, multiple rotating mini publics? So first it could automate most of the existing human tasks that are not deliberation per se. So as I said before, actually facilitation could be one task. Translation, although it would be a very basic form of translation, not the kind of political translation that Nicole Doer, for example, has advocated for where it's uh, much more normatively uh, loaded kind of translation where you take into account cultural backgrounds and hegemonies and inequalities and you try to correct for them. 
So maybe that would still be needed and you'd, he you'd need human translators for that kind of function. Fact checking is another function um, that could be potentially automated, although there's so much disagreement about facts even today that that might be a very, very difficult task. And finally, data organization and analysis. Um, but there are also things that the AI could do that humans cannot really do. So the, 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 let's call them the new affordances. Um, the first one is tracking and documenting all exchanges. And that apparently is something that, again, Jim Fishkin is already doing uh, with his team, with the AI. Another thing that the AI could do is measure the quality of deliberation using, for example, um, a discourse uh, quality index, which is available to, to sort of plot in real time the, the, the quality of the deliberation among participants. It could allow groups to take a cognitive group selfie, if you will, so they know at every point where they stand in terms of emerging consensus, degrees of polarization, quality of deliberation, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe the AI could be used in somewhat interventionist ways to um, help consensus emerge by planting ideas, seeding, you know, um, seeding ideas to, to help speed up the convergence. It could also help groups decide when to rotate within assemblies and between assemblies, when people have been exposed to a sufficient number of arguments and have a sense of that they're going in circle, for example. It could finally pick up on, on good or contagious ideas uh, and make, it, make sure they get transferred to other groups, um, even if deliberation in the other groups ends before those ideas are properly discussed or, or have become consensual. I'm, I'm, of course, not sure at all about any of these suggestions. I just think that uh, um, if the goal is to get to a, um, a common vision or, or a, a proposal, um, time is of the essence. And if AI can help speed that process up, maybe that's a good thing. So of course, there are uh, a number of possible issues with everything I've talked about so far. Is it even possible to have neutral and biased uh, impartial AI facilitators, fact checkers, translators, data analysts? Um, that's still an open question. What if the AI picks up on terrible viral ideas like anti-immigration sentiments and anti-minority or anti-elite views or views that are not fact checkable or are even true but dangerous? and help spread populist wildfires rather than reasonable consensus. Obviously, that would be an issue. And even if all of that works out, um, there might be remaining normative objections against this approximation of all inclusive deliberation. So I'm not entirely sure that Christina Lafon would be happy with um, just 10% of the population enrolled in mini publics as an approximation of all inclusive deliberation. I don't know what else she would have in mind, but that's my best um, attempt at offering a, a solution. So in conclusion, I think that yes, AI in theory could help bring deliberation to the masses. We will never get to mass deliberation in the sense of fully inclusive deliberation, but we can get to an approximation either as mass online deliberation or um, multiple uh, rotating mini publics amounting to perhaps 10% of the population. And we may have to accept the legitimizing power of such a good enough approximation for now in my view, it would be still better than settling for, you know, deliberation for the view coupled with a referendum here and there. Uh, and it would still be better, better than giving up on deliberative democracy as a theory of political legitimacy. It's something that um, I presented those ideas in New York and, and um, Jeremy Waldron told me, but that's, you know, why do we need such a high threshold? Why don't we just settle for majority rule or something like that? It's it's nice to have deliberative democracy, but it's not strictly necessary. And I think the problem is if we do that, then we, we will never even try. And if we never even try, we'll be stuck with the current system, which is not uh, legitimizing enough. Uh, and finally, I have a question for you now. Uh, of all the things I've described, what, what is uh, truly possible at this moment in time? I'm actually not sure that AI is anywhere close to, um, to um, being ready to make this vision possible. So I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much.
All right, we've got about 15 minutes, a little more for questions. Uh, uh, I see a hand over here. Let me encourage other folks to, to raise their hands as well. Um, if you could say your name when, uh, when you ask your question. Uh, Seth, go ahead, and I'm going to repeat it here for the Zoom audience. Hey, I'm Seth Rizal from Montreal University. Um, really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you for that. Um, I've heard there's a, a student of ours in the ANU talking about some of the problems with our government facilitation of immigration, which I'll turn you on later on. Um, but I wanted to raise one particular issue around the kind of the, the proposed use of um, AI to kind of uh, synthesize debate and to kind of generate um, sort of uh, convergence around certain types yeah. of proposals. Um, I was just thinking that there's a tension between two ideals that you find in Josh Cohen's work and in the deliberative democratic tradition, one of them the public reason ideal, and the other the kind of uh, the deliberative ideal that you're articulating. Yeah. And I, I wonder whether the sort of the opacity of the types of machine learning systems that we use in order to synthesize judgments into those convergent opinions yeah. would form a problem for the public reason requirement because you wouldn't necessarily be able to unpick precisely why it was surfacing this particular aspect mm. as being something that people were converging. So yeah, would you be able to? Would, is there a tension between the kind of the facilitation of that deliberation and the public reason requirement um, if you try and use AI? I'm going to repeat the question and then turn, turn the floor over to you. I won't get all of that question for everybody, but if for anyone on Zoom who didn't get a chance to hear that, Seth Lazar is a philosophy uh, professor at, at Australian National University visiting here for the, uh, for the week as well. Um, it's curious about two separate ideals of how it is that um, a reasoning together, deliberating together might work, a public reason ideal that comes out of a kind of Rawlsian tradition, and then a, a deliberative ideal that, that stands connected but separate from it, and then how this AI facilitated convergence or synthesis, synthesis of, of actual deliberation might um, work a, according to either of these respective ideals. Uh, thank you, Seth, for the question. So I think you're right, there's a tension there. Uh, I, need to, I need to think more about this actually. And I think it connects to this idea of explainability and justifiability that I, I think I'm gonna write my next paper on because I need to clarify for myself what, what exactly are we demanding here? You know, I, are we demanding, because even when we talk amongst each other, we don't have access to our inner algorithm. We're doing our best to share our reasons for certain things, but there's a degree of opacity that remains even there. So when we, we think of, it, of our algorithm, how transparent to us do they need to be? Um, I'm not entirely sure, so I need to clarify that for myself. But concretely, what I'm thinking of when I think of the aggregating function of algorithm in a deliberative context, I'm thinking of, um, you know, the, the, the algorithm sort of brings together all the similar arguments. It doesn't cover them up, so you still have access to them. So Maybe you don't know why the algorithm is doing what it's doing, but at least you still have access to the reasons of your fellow citizens. So those are not buried. You don't, you, you don't just get the outcome of the, of the deliberation in, in one assembly shoved to the next one without a proper justificator, justificator, justificatory, um, you know, um, um, argument behind that conclusion. Right, so hopefully we would not lose that. Otherwise, like it defeats the purpose. You you do want to get to the reasons that people have, and um, so does that help a little bit answer the worry or? Yeah, but I yeah okay we can talk about it. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna get two questions from our Zoom audience in. Uh, um, each of them e easily stated. So one question um, for you, Helen, is how to think about the possibility of sec securing the technological systems against adversarial attacks. So um, should we be worried about data poisoning, various deliberate forms of deception, and, and absent genuine confidence in the security of the systems, how should we think about experimenting with them? That's one question. The second one is, um, uh, uh, I think very interesting, is I'll just read it it's from Thorsten Sturck. In online citizen assemblies, the preservation of facial expressions and body language is minimized in online citizen assemblies. So trust and friendship work best, he says, in face-to-face -face encounters. Therefore, online assemblies have shortcomings in genuine embodied exchange and deliberation. How does, how does your, your approach think about this kind of problem? Two great questions. So the first one, I think, yes, there's no point in trying these things if we cannot ensure the data security and the privacy, you know, 
uh, of, of the participants, for example. So that, that's definitely a constraint. It's a technological constraint that I wouldn't know, you know how to address myself. So I'm hoping it can be done. And what gives me reasons to think it can be done is it's always the example I give, but like Goldman Sachs, you know, does transaction in a billion dollar range all the time. And you don't hear of security breaches there. So surely we can hire engineers of that caliber to make sure democratic innovations are protected in the same way. It's just, I think it's a matter of investing enough and getting the best minds and, and building very, very secure architectures. And I, I mean, I, maybe I'm wrong, but that's how I would answer this question. And the second question about the limitations of online um, deliberation, I, I fully agree that, that there's a trade-off there in terms of, you know, cost and, and then uh, um, civic friendship or bonds that can emerge from a merely virtual encounters. Um, so my answer there is to say, look, in a, in a system like the one I envision in my Open Democracy book, people would not, it wouldn't be the first time they're involved in something like that. They would have experience with being involved in face-to-face -face, uh, randomly selected mini publics at the local level, at their city council level, um, uh, on the school board. or So they, they have a sense of how this works and they develop a trust, not just in the people they actually meet in those settings, but in the people they could meet in other settings. And so what they would bring to a virtual meeting is a, is, is a, a priori trust in other randomly selected citizens. So it's, it's a different kind of uh, uh, society that would inhabit um, not the polarized one we're in where we don't trust anyone and, and the first instinct is to be skeptical. And I've seen the skepticism and it's true, it's much better to start there with like physical face-to-face -face meetings in, in the Citizens Convention for Climate, which is the one I've spent you know, the most time looking at. People came in very skeptical. France is a, is a society of suspicion, the distrust. And the first day, they were all looking at each other, gauging the situation, not believing for a second that this was for real. By the end of the nine months, they cared about each other, loved each other, trusted each other. So it's it's going to take time, and and you can't launch, you know, a society into something like what I envisage right away. But I think there are preconditions for it that are not um, out of it out of reach. Good. The, qu the question for the Zoom audience has to do with um, how mass deliberation facilitated by AI um, could handle issues of agenda setting in addition to the deliberation that takes place within some pre-established frame, and then a number of different suggestions about particular fora in, in which um, perhaps the sophistication of AI tools may be unnecessary, but um, additional technological supports could facilitate deliberation at some scale. So I think it could do both. Um, so the French great national debate only did the, the issue discussion, right? Because I mean, President Macron was somewhat probably scared of already the scope of all of this. So he assigned four questions. One had to do with uh, taxation, one, one was about uh, public administration, organization of the state. One has to do with democracy and participation and the other was um, the environment and ecological issues. That was already big enough, but you, you would notice if you're French that he really didn't want the French to talk about immigration, for example. So that was off the table, that was not part of the agenda. And I actually think that I don't see any reasons to limit the agenda. So I think there could be moments of mass participation that are about setting the agenda. 
There could be other moments that are about a particular issue, say Brexit. You know, um, uh, right now, as I, you know, I, Rob mentioned that I'm on the governance committee of the next Citizens Assembly in France, and it's on assisted dying. So we can fully expect, you know, I mean, not no, we cannot fully expect. We ex we hope that there will be a referendum at the end. That would be a great moment to have a moment of mass deliberation before the vote about assisted dying, which is a single issue, right? So I think you could uh, do anything really. It's a matter of design. And then your idea of um, having uh, parliamentarians basically work with the input or the you know yeah the, the input of of, uh, of large samples of population why not i think that's another area in which we could experiment i know that in belgium right now they do these parliamentary commissions uh, mixed parliamentary commissions sorry where they bring in uh you know ordinary citizens to help the work of parliamentarians and usually it's in the ratio of two thirds to one third it's working brilliantly uh, hybrids, hybrid mixes do not always work, but this one apparently works quite well. So, All right, right over here, sir. Thank you. I want to answer your question, Professor, because I think in California, for sure, the most cycles of computing power in artificial intelligence spent on deliberation is in machine translation, not by people who prepare ballots, who are usually professional people, but um, people who don't understand English that well, they're using machine translation just to do everyday ordinary research you know find out you know what the laws are for parking on their street for example mm. um we are so low tech in our ballots we cannot even ask the electorate to give us a number which i think you know because we don't have median ballots it, it puts us at a ter terrible disadvantage uh to, to those who can afford to lobby have so much control because we don't have this basic <laughs> data type as part of our balloting system but I want to ask you a question. What do you think about the UK's uh, citizen petition uh, system and how, how well has that been working in, in Great Britain? Um, so you mean citizens initiatives? Yeah, so I'm actually not familiar with the UK version, but um, uh, in, in Switzerland, it works really well. <laughs> so I, I think there are different ways to, to, to do it. And I don't like the Californian one because it has no deliberative step. Uh, it goes straight to ballot, and that's not a good thing. But in Switzerland, there's a there's a dialogue with parliamentarians before it's sent to a, a referendum. So it allows some correction or some reformulation. Or I think the the parliamentarians have to come up with a different version of the question. And um, if they cannot, or it, it goes straight to the ballot anyway. I, I just I don't remember exactly the details. But yeah, that's another way to bring in the 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 top, the bottom up sort of a um, spirit. Often the UKs, when they reach a threshold, they have to be answered in writing. And if they reach a larger threshold, they have to be deliberated in the House of Commons. And um, a lot of the people are not satisfied with the way that, uh, for example, most of those deliberations that reach that larger threshold almost never result in legislation. Yeah, so it's it's close to participation washing. You pretend to listen, but at the end it goes and dies in committees. So that's not good. Uh, it, ne it needs to have more bite, obviously. And you could also have another form of um, citizens initiative that that's called the, the recall or something like that. You can actually initiate also a recall of an existing law or a recall of an existing politician. And so there are all forms, all ways to increase participation, but they're not going to lead you to mass participation. I think it's, you know, that that's a little bit of a different question than the one I'm trying to solve here. I'm going to go back to the, the Zoom audience. So the most upvoted question is from Hector Dominguez. I'm going to read it aloud and give a gloss on it as well. An essential challenge in democracy is the power component between those participating in deliberation. How, how power should be weighted or could be weighted and included in an algorithm to assure fairness? Um, you gave this lovely phrase about the forceless force of the better argument. Um, I'm wondering if there are baked in assumptions about equal power capabilities amongst um, participants in any of these online or, or actually embodied citizen assemblies. Um, how do you think about differential power, whether it's rhetorical or otherwise, um, and how does AI treat that? Yeah, well, it's a random draw of the population. You're going to have exactly the same power dynamics that you have in the larger population, but you can hope that in this much more structured, facilitated, monitored context, you can minimize them to a degree and you can empower people who usually feel spoken over to fight back. And 
That's what I've observed in the French Convention for Climate. Women were incredibly vocal. They would just not let, you know, the usual suspects speak, speak over them. Um, minorities also, perhaps less so, had a had a, a way to resist in this context that they don't have in, in typically the, the self-selected, um, self-organized groups. Because what happens is that in, when it's self-selected, somebody needs to become foreman or chair. It's always the more the, the older more senior white person in the room and then that completely changes the dynamics and it's not at all whereas in, in this in this sort of a setups it's of course you're still going to have sexism racism all kinds of dynamic that are bad but they are minimized and you can vocalize you can sort of voice them you can appeal to the organizers to do something about them you can teach and educate each other that's the other thing like they learn it's a learning process for everyone involved so um, I don't want to be overly optimistic, but I just don't see what 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 compares in terms of uh, you know a place where you can actually fight back against those things. All right, we're going to be respectful of people's time. It's just eleven o'clock. There are a number of different hands in the air. Please feel free to come up afterwards in order to ask Ellen any question you have. Would you, in the meantime, join me in thanking Ellen Landamore?